Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we can finish close to three. So, we've got the introductory slide. Okay, so yeah, we, we've got more of these great pictures of Victoria. They're everywhere, and I think I showed them in part one. She loved the technology, and uh, these pictures are often sent at Christmas, they're sent on birthdays. I've just finished some, doing some research on Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and when you go to the house that he basically spent the last 20 years of his life in, in Holland, he's got one of the uh, prized possessions is a uh, picture of Victoria that she signed, that she gave to him uh, for the new year. So these are just further examples of Queen Victoria. Um, and the recap essentially is that she's been queen for 24 years. Uh, she's been married for 21. Uh, she's had nine children. And of course, we ended uh, part one with the death of her husband. Uh, she basically enters a long and kind of dark period in her life where she's largely depressed. She isn't diagnosed, but she's you know, unable to cope with the loss of her husband. And slowly over time, um, she's going to find her way back. And two people who are going to help her find her way back to some kind of normalcy are going to be John Brown. And we'll talk a lot about him. And the second guy that I'm sure some of you will also know is um, Abdul Karim. So we will uh, certainly be talking about both of those. And there they are. Um, that's Alvin at the top. And we've got John Brown in the middle. And we've got uh, Kareem uh, at the bottom. So uh, let's just very quickly just go back to where we ended uh, part one. So Albert's just died. I tried to find a better picture of the, this is supposed to be the blue room. You're looking at it on the left in Windsor Castle. Uh, I couldn't find any good pictures online, uh, but this I believe is a pretty good uh, accurate representation of what the room looked like. Um, if you remember at the end, uh, Albert uh, uh, contracts, uh, typhoid and um, in a space of about less than three weeks he'll die. Um, the f immediately prior to his death uh, one stage of typhoid is delirium and Albert is wandering from room to room and he actually settles on this room, the blue room. Uh, interestingly uh, it was the same room where George IV and William IV both chose to die. Albert chose it um, and this is one of the criticisms I made of Victoria at the end is that she didn't really hire any professional nurses. Uh, she gave responsibility for taking care of her sick husband to the daughter, Alice. And as you can see in the photograph on the right, um, essentially she turns this room into a mausoleum. You can see uh, in the photograph uh, she's got wreaths and flowers on the bed to show uh, where he died uh, every single day. She had fresh water, uh, clean clothes laid out for him. She had all his shaving materials. Anything that he would have normally have had uh, was provided for him, although, of course, uh, he's dead. Uh, but that didn't stop Victoria from demanding that the uh, routine of their life together in that room at least continued. Um, and uh, interestingly, another sort of slightly weird little fact is that the daughter who took care of him, Alice, uh, she would die on the same day, um, 17 years later. And although not in the blue room, she would die in Germany. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about uh, Victoria's reaction to that death. It won't surprise you to uh, hear me say that uh, Victoria was essentially numb with shock. Um, she simply um, wasn't able to cope. We sort of had a little taste of this uh, a few months earlier when her mother died. She didn't particularly have a good uh, relationship with her mother, but um, the mother dies suddenly and Victoria's reaction is rather excessive. Um, she has a complete breakdown and she takes several months in order to recover from that. Uh, obviously her reaction to Albert's death is gonna be uh, much, much worse. Uh, the children pick that up too. Uh, one of her daughters, Louise, um, she sobbed at the father. Louise at this point is probably still a teenager. 
um, maybe 13, maybe 14 years old. She's sobbing at her father's bedside. Why didn't he take me? Um, two days later, on December the 16th, uh, the Queen is at least uh, alert enough to issue orders to the court that ladies attending the court are expected to wear what she calls black woolen stuffs, trimmed with crepe, plain linen, black shoes, gloves, and crepe fans. So already we get the beginning of what we always assume uh, when we see pictures of Victoria, particularly later in her life, is that she goes into mourning immediately. and She's going to stay in this mourning um, essentially for the rest of her life. Uh, Victoria is going to spend a few more days at Windsor. Uh, Albert dies at Windsor. Um, and she's going to move to Osborne, which probably is a surprising choice, but perhaps it isn't really. Um, surprising in the sense that um, it's a place that she and Albert built together. But um, at this particular point, um, she is not expected to attend the funeral. And that isn't because she isn't, doesn't have, she isn't emotionally strong enough to attend the funeral. Um, the sort of the protocol um, in the mid 19th century was that women were not, at least high class women, royal women, noble women, were not expected to attend funerals. Uh, that was uh, something that only men did. And for those of you wondering why women were not expected to attend funerals, was because the prevailing view was that women were not uh, emotionally strong enough uh, to attend. So uh, Victoria will head to Osborne and her son and some of the other male relatives uh, of the family will remain at Windsor uh, for the funeral. Um, however, one important thing that she does before she leaves to go to Osborne, which you remember is a little, uh, I, I, she could call it a cottage. Um, it's a pretty substantial uh, property um, in the Isle of Wight. And before she leaves to go to Osborne, uh, she is going to pick a site for her mausoleum. And it's close to Windsor. It's at a place called Frogmore. And we'll get to that in a second. Okay, next slide. I'll do my three second thing. So, in addition to. Oh, sorry. Do you actually have a question? Was okay. Queen Victoria essentially a figurehead with no real power, as is Elizabeth II today? Yes, yes, she was. Um, Victoria is somebody who reigns. So she does have a role, but she doesn't exercise any power. She doesn't rule. Uh, unlike, say, her relatives, the Kaiser Wilhelm, um, who both reigns and rules, or unlike, say, uh, Nicholas Romanov, who reigns and rules, who would exercise, well, in the case of Nicholas Romanov, he's exercising the powers of an autocrat. Uh, in the case of um, the Kaiser Wilhelm, he's exercising the powers consistent to what a president would have in the United States, something kind of similar. But no, Victoria has the right to be consulted about what's happening in her government. She has the right to question her ministers. She has the right to see uh, government papers, but she does not have the right to drive policy. Uh, she does not have the right to refuse to sign laws. Uh, once a bill is presented to her, she is expected to sign it. She does not have to say the power that a US president would have which is the power to veto a piece of legislation. Victoria doesn't have that. I tried to do some research to find out if that had ever happened. And the closest thing I could find was about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the King of Belgium, uh, Belgium is a, well, the King of Belgium is at least Catholic, and Belgium about 15 years ago passed an abortion law. And um, the King went to his ministers and said, you know, I can't in all honesty agree to this piece of legislation as a Catholic. And so what he did was he abdicated, the legislation passed in his absence, and then he resumed as king again. But nothing like this happened to Victoria. Whatever was given to her, she signed. But nevertheless, as you know, we see in part one, she really takes very seriously this role of, you know, keeping on top of the government and its, um, its activities. Good question. And we have a second question. Yes. Did she meet regularly with the prime minister like Elizabeth has in the past? Uh, no, Elizabeth meets about once a week when Parliament's in session on a Tuesday. Uh, Victoria would meet, uh, first of all, Parliament met for shorter sessions, used typically about eight weeks. 
and Victoria would meet then, uh, and then she would take, uh, she would spend part of the winter in Osborne, she spent the summers in Scotland, and ministers could get up to see her, and certainly important papers could be brought up to Scotland or, uh, or down to Osborne. The English have this system called the red boxes, where papers are transferred back and forth between the government minister and the monarch, but no, she wouldn't meet regularly. Uh, and I've got a little story about Gladstone, who tries desperately to schedule a meeting with her and goes all the way up to Balmoral to meet with her. And she keeps him waiting there four days uh, because she won't meet with him. And then when she does finally agree to meet with him, um, she'll only schedule 30 minutes. And he says afterwards that she spent the entire 30 minutes yelling at him about something related to her family, uh, not related to anything that he wanted to discuss as prime minister. Uh, okay, I'll carry on. So, uh, we talked about the rules around dress and how women are expected to dress in the morning. Uh, Victoria also instituted additional rules uh, for this period of mourning. Um, so, for example, in Windsor, uh, people were told not to knock. So, if you needed to enter a room and the door was closed, you were asked not to knock on the door. You could gently scratch on the door. That was permitted, but noises, knocks, were not permitted. Uh, I mentioned about Albert's clothes. We know that they were laid out. We know that the water was laid out. Uh, the photograph, uh, this was taken a couple of hours after he died. Um, and, uh, you know, you could, we mentioned, you know, they haven't even fixed his hair. This photograph is going to stay with Victoria for the rest of her life, whatever. Uh, she travels, the photograph goes, and when we see uh, her deathbed, uh, she doesn't have this particular photograph in the scene, but we do get to see a picture of Albert. So um, she always has an image of him with her at all times. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we know about the wardrobe. We know it's black, it's unadorned. Um, essentially, she's wearing these kind of ugly caps, which we call widow's peaks. Um, the jewelry, uh, prior to Albert's death, she wore incredible jewelry the way an only a British monarch could because they've got the uh, most extensive uh, jewelry collection in the world. Um, she stops wearing the jewelry, um, largely because she feels, what's the point anymore? She doesn't have a husband uh, to, uh, he would buy jewels for her so that he could see her wearing them. He's gone and her point is, well, why do I need to wear jewelry anymore? Because he's not around. Um, same with clothing, um, even after the period of mourning's over, uh, Victoria doesn't want to wear fashionable clothes. She doesn't want to wear her hair in a fashionable way because from her point of view, without Albert around, what's the point? He would have commented on her clothes. He would have commented on her hair. He's not around, so she's not going to do it. Um, only in 1864 do we get a slight uh, change in the rules. So this is going to be over two years after Albert's death. Women were permitted to wear uh, gray, some white, and purple. Um, mauve was considered kind of frisky. So we do have a sort of uh, a lessening in the restrictions, but essentially for Victoria, this is going to continue for the rest of her life. Uh, and only gradually for other women at the court are they going to be able to wear uh, regular clothes. So funeral preparations. Now so, would add a question. Sure. How was Abdul received at court other than by Victoria? I will, can I, can I come to that when I get to that? I, I promise I will get to that because there is a, there's a short section on that uh, when we get to Abdul Karim. Um, funeral. So, uh, first of all, uh, before the uh, Albert is placed in his coffin, the, the, her daughters, her five daughters, are instructed to remove locks of hair um, uh, their hair and the, uh, they, the, their hair is placed in the coffin. Uh, locks of Albert's hair were removed. So the daughters put their hair in the coffin, in Albert's coffin, and they remove part of Albert's hair and they make mourning jewelry out of it. Um, if you've ever been to England, uh, to some of the historic homes, um, occasionally you'll see these display cases and people have made brooches with hair They've, I've seen examples of small little purses with her. They've woven it into picture frames. Uh, but the daughters do make mourning jewelry. Uh, 
What you're looking at here is a painting by a German artist called Winterhalter. Um, and this was um, Albert's favorite portrait of Victoria. And so a copy, a photograph, not the original, but a photograph of this painting uh, was placed in Albert's hands in the coffin. This went into the coffin, a photograph of it. Uh, on Monday, Victoria will depart. So a couple of days after his death, uh, she's basically carried out of Windsor uh, because she doesn't want to leave. Um, and the children virtually have to like physically lift her up and sort of force her into the carriage so they can get her out of Windsor so that the uh, funeral can go ahead. Um, once she's gone, um, the final prep preparations will begin. Next slide, please. Um, so Albert's body will be placed into two coffins. There's an inner coffin with an inner wooden lined shell with white satin, and then there's an outer casing of lead. And then, on, and then both of those coffins will go into what's called a massive state coffin, which is made of mahogany. So essentially there's three coffins here. Um, funerals are not like funerals today uh, when a member of the royal family dies. If any of you remember the death of Princess Diana, it was this huge, big state occasion. Um, in the mid 19th century, funerals were not state occasions. They were still private affairs. And so the public uh, wasn't invited to attend and there were no uh, parading the coffins through the streets so that people could stand and pay their last respects. Victoria's funeral will be that kind of funeral, but Albert's isn't. It's a small, uh, it's a private affair. Uh, we've already mentioned women couldn't attend. The press were only allowed to attend uh, in what's called the organ loft uh, at uh, St. George's Chapel at Windsor. Uh, there's no public procession. And strangely, Victoria, although I said uh, Victoria didn't attend, she did allow two women to attend, uh, but uh, the Duchesses of Wellington and Sutherland, but they both were told that they had to remain out of sight. So they could be physically in the church for the funeral service, but they could not be seen. Um, and essentially, uh, because Albert has died suddenly, Victoria has picked the site uh, for the mausoleum. Uh, what she does is, um, instead of placing Albert's body in the crypt, because St. George's Chapel at Windsor, which is the church at Windsor, it has a crypt. And that's where uh, British monarchs are, are, that's where their remains are, are laid to rest. Uh, the Victoria did not want Albert's remains in the same crypt as, if you remember her, what she calls her wicked uncles, her two immediate predecessors, George IV and William IV, uh, who led kind of scandalous lives and had relationships with women and drank and gambled and did all these things. Well, maybe not the drinking, but certainly the, the gambling and the womanizing. Uh, she did not want Albert's body to be with their remains. And so what she does is she has Albert's body placed immediately outside the crypt. And it's going to remain in that state coffin, that massive state coffin for about two years because the mausoleum is going to be built. And so the uh, coffin can't go to its final resting place until the mausoleum is ready. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We have a question, Andrew. Yeah. Mary Ann would like to know, why were the two women allowed to attend the funeral? I don't know. I don't know why she gave permission. I don't know what was special about these two women. All I know was that she allowed them to attend and I don't know why. Um, she, didn't, she didn't attend herself. She didn't allow any of her daughters to attend, but um, she allowed these two women and I, I've never been able to find out why. That's a great question though. And Linda would like to know, could she have remarried? Could she have remarried at that point? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, just bear in mind, well, first of all, uh, under the Royal Marriages Act, uh, first of all, the head of the royal family makes decisions, and that would be Victoria. So she could obviously authorize herself uh, to remarry. However, under the Royal Marriages Act, she does remarry. Sorry? If she does remarry, she uh, needs to marry a royal, somebody of the royal blood, and that person needs to be a Protestant. British law at that point, and I believe so today, excluded Catholics. 
from marrying into the royal family and keeping their position in terms of the line of succession. So if she does marry, she will need to marry, at least under British law at that point, uh, at least somebody Protestant, and certainly as it was understood, somebody who was royal. Next slide, please. So um, just to finish off this section on the morning, um, as I mentioned in the first presentation, I like Victoria, but we're going to begin to see her do things that I don't like as much. And this period of mourning and its excessiveness essentially provides Victoria with some cover. Um, although she still takes seriously her role as a monarch um, in terms of, you know, being sort of head of the executive branch and, and overseeing what government is doing, it does allow her to avoid having to meet people that she doesn't like. Uh, for example, uh, William Gladstone, very famous, famous uh, 19th century uh, liberal British prime minister. She doesn't like him. I'm not sure whether he liked her, but she certainly doesn't like him. And she will use the excuse uh, that, you know, she's in mourning, she's recovering, she's a woman that's trying to, you know, put her life back together. And she will use this as a way to avoid uh, meeting and doing things that she doesn't like to do. Uh, at court, December the 14th, the day that Albert dies, becomes uh, essentially a holy day. Um, and there's weeping, there's prayers, and, you know, Victoria will sort of exploit this, um, you know, for her own sort of uh, nefarious ends. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the Royal Mausoleum. So this is what took two years to build. Uh, this is close to Windsor. Um, this is Albert's uh, outside the crypt, because of those wicked un uncles. It's pretty impressive. Uh, I went to Windsor. Uh, Rita and I went to Windsor about 15 years ago. We didn't go to the mausoleum. It and, wasn't open. Uh, for a long time, actually, it was uh, closed because of flooding. Uh, but I now believe, uh, if we go back, can we go back to the prior slide? I just want to show two things. Uh, one is you can see the sort of, the church, what looks like a Romanesque style church. Um, and then outside, are uh, those are the, uh, what looks like gravestones outside. That's a royal burial ground. And I don't know which particular graves we're looking at in that picture, but um, people like Edward VIII are buried there. Wallace Simpson is buried there. Uh, several other uh, members of her, uh, her children, most of them I believe are buried there. And not all, but certainly most. So that's what it looks like on the outside. And then on the inside, um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Conrad? Yes, uh, who paid for the mausoleum, Victoria or Great Britain? Yeah. Oh, yes, she's essentially, she's got an income of close to about $34 million um, a year in today's money, provided for by the taxpayer. So essentially she paid for it with that money. She may also have got government grants as well um, to finance some of it. But essentially, with that much money, you know, she could easily finance it on her own. And so, um, as you can see inside, it's pretty lavish. Um, next slide, please. And there's always been something about this. Um, I always believed that when, because I've never been there, but when you look at this particular slide here, you can clearly see Victoria. And there she's a slimmed down version of herself. She's got her, her royal regalia. Um, and of course, we've got Albert next to her. And um, I'd, I'd always believed that the two of them were the only people inside the mausoleum, or people outside the mausoleum and the burial grounds. But then when you look back in the distance, it sort of looks like a tomb. Now, I can't tell. I don't know if it's a, just some kind of reclining servant uh, who might be um, who might be just sort of there as part of the decoration. But um, it looks like a tomb, but I believe it isn't. So I need to do a little bit more research on actually the mausoleum itself, because I do believe there's only two people in there. But if you look at that particular image, it does look like there's a tomb back there. But I think it's a, a reclining angel or servant or somebody. Um, so anyway, we mentioned that it was closed. Is it, sorry, is that a question again? Is this death date versus birth date? Yeah, I think it's, um, it is kind of odd, but I think it's, it just really reflects how she felt about him. 
I mean, for her, it was a day uh, that, you know, she will remember for the rest of her life. And in fact, when we mentioned that 17 years later, her daughter dies on the same day. And then three years after that, she nearly lost her son as well on that day. He didn't die, uh, but he came close to death. And so it's a day that everybody at court knows that Victoria is on edge. You know, it's a day when you, you know, if you're at court on December the 14th, you really need to be on your A game with this woman. Um, one other little thing I want to mention about the mausoleum is that Victoria will come back here again and again and again. Uh, it's a place where she believes very strongly that she can sense Albert's presence. Um, she feels it there all the time. Um, she, the mausoleum opens in 1863, and uh, her eldest son, Bertie, is going to be married in 1864. Um, she will bring her son and his bride to the mausoleum uh, to get Albert's approval. Now, I don't know what the bride thought about, you know, the fact that she'd been brought to a mausoleum uh, to get the approval of her dead uh, father-in-law, but, um, you know, <laughs> This is a common theme again and again with Victoria. You know, she likes to bring people there uh, so that Albert can meet them. And of course she can be close to Albert. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think we mentioned a little bit about this in presentation one, but uh, Victoria, uh, particularly after the death of Albert, but even before the death of Albert, uh, she has this strong interest in spiritualism, um, essentially like table wrapping. Uh, she and Albert had enjoyed it together. Um, she has fascinations with ghosts and hauntings, although I couldn't find any particular stories uh, of things that had happened to her. Um, we talked about the mausoleum. She really gets a strong sense of Albert's uh, in the mausoleum. And as well as having a picture of him above her bed, wherever she travels, she also has a locket with his picture. And so when she's traveling around, uh, if she sees something particularly beautiful, she mentioned Scotland a lot. If she's taking a drive uh, and she sees something, you know, she will take out the locket and she will show the locket what she can see because obviously she believes that Albert can see it too. Um, so, okay. Next slide. Okay, let's get to John Brown. So here he is, uh, John Brown. Uh, he's seven years younger than Victoria. He's gonna be born in 1826. She's born in 1819. Uh, he's gonna die though, uh, long before she does. Uh, he's died, he dies in 1883. Um, and we first come across him, he is a royal ghillie. Um, and he's had in Balmoral, and for people who don't know what a ghillie is, it's a hunter and a fisherman. Uh, so he's based initially in Balmoral, and he will, he's well known to Albert. Albert likes to hunt. He's not a particularly uh, talented hunter, but he does enjoy it. And he, John Brown, would take Albert out, show him places where they could, you know, fish and hunt. Um, and as early as 1851, um, Victoria comes across him, and she hires him to lead her royal pony. Uh, she's starting to gain weight at this point. And in addition with having all these pregnancies, it's not considered safe for her to ride a horse. And so uh, she will get taken around on a pony and John Brown will lead it. Uh, by 1858, so whatever John Brown's done, uh, he gets uh, a sort of a little uh, title promotion. He is what's called her particular ghillie. So, uh, Whenever she has ghillie requests, John Brown is expected to uh, fulfill them for her. And she doesn't like to work with anybody else, only John Brown. And at some point, uh, he takes it upon himself. She doesn't request this, but he decides that this is what he wants to do. He makes himself um, a self-appointed bodyguard. So, um, you know, the two of them are spending a lot of time together. Um, that's only in Scotland. Um, with the death of Albert, uh, somebody in London has the bright idea that, oh, why don't we bring down John Brown to Windsor? Uh, the Queen always liked him. And uh, let's see if that improves her mood. In other words, gets her out of that morning, the depression, 
Well, yeah, actually he does. Uh, her mood brightens a lot. Uh, she becomes a lot more cheerful. And so in 1864, he is reassigned to Windsor and he gets a very nice salary. He's getting paid about 120 British pounds a year. Uh, a typical working man would make a pound a week. So he's getting 120 pounds, he's getting his food, he's getting his lodging provided. So, you know, he's got a pretty good gig. Next slide, please. Uh, and what, you, what we're looking at here on the right is uh, some of Victoria's drawings of uh, John Brown. As you'll remember from uh, the first presentation, Victoria is a very talented, art, very talented artist. She loves to draw. These particular drawings were made before Albert's death. Uh, but uh, we can clearly see that, you know, John Brown is somebody who is clearly, uh, somebody is very important to her. And clearly after Albert's death, uh, his importance only uh, grows. Um, understandably though, uh, the people around her are quick to notice uh, John Brown's arrival in Windsor. And comments and rumors begin, as you would probably expect. Uh, Victoria will tell people, and she, one particular example, she tells her daughter, Vicky, uh, that, you know, uh, God knows, this is what she says uh, when people ask about jo John Brown, she says, God knows how much I, wanted to, I want to be taken care of. Um, so she sees John Brown as somebody who will take care of her. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, she will tell other people that she regards Highlanders, uh, people from Northern Scotland, she regards Highlanders as what she calls high bread, full of poetry, simplicity, and truth, okay? Um, she will tolerate in John Brown things that she won't tolerate in others. Even though we know Victoria likes whiskey herself, uh, she does not like to see people drunk around her, uh, but nevertheless, um, John Brown's rather considerable whiskey consumption is tolerated. Uh, she will also tolerate that he calls her woman, uh, which um, I don't think my English accent really does justice to the way it's, if I tried to spell it for you, it would be W-U-M-M-A-N. Rather than calling her mom or your royal highness or your majesty, he calls her woman. Uh, and at another time, he criticizes her because she's wearing a ratty old dress. Uh, Victoria didn't really seem to worry about if her clothes had holes in them or they looked threadbare. Uh, that wasn't something that particularly bothered her. Um, and interestingly, and we'll talk more about this in a second, he had uh, unprecedented access to her private apartments. Uh, very few servants, you know, unless you were somebody who was taking care of her clothing or helping her to bathe or, or fix her hair. Very few servants had unprecedented access to her private apartments, but John Brown did. Um, of course, it doesn't take too long for uh, not just the people in the court to um, spread rumors and um, rumors get here, not so much into the press in Britain, because Britain has pretty strict uh, libel laws, but uh, in Europe, in the European courts, uh, people are talking about and saying that the Queen of England is secretly married to John Brown, okay? Um, however, of course, nobody in Britain will publish those kinds of uh, accusations because, um, you know, the libel laws were quite strict. Yes, we have a question. The question was actually, was John Brown married? I'm gonna to get to that because we're, we're gonna look at this two different ways. Uh, so what I did was I collected information both for and against. So, next slide. So, um, I tried to read a whole slew of biographies about Victoria. And the, one of the biographies, which is considered the most authoritative um, of the biographies of Victoria. Uh, and Longford writes, so this is the, the author of the biography, Longford writes that the queen was neither John Brown's mistress nor his morganatic wife. Uh, morganatic wife means when a royal person marries a non-royal person. It's still a legal marriage, but the non-royal person doesn't enjoy the same status in the marriage or, or outside the marriage 
as the royal person. So it's a morganatic marriage. So Longford writes that the queen was neither jump round mistress nor his morganatic wife should be clear from a character, from a study of her character. So, you know, this biographer believes it's impossible that Victoria would ever have considered uh, marriage. However, uh, that's one side of the argument. However, John Brown's own diary was burned after his death. So uh, we don't know by whom, uh, we can probably guess why, but the, the diary was burned. Uh, and later on, when we talk about Victoria's funeral, um, Sir James Reed, who was the doctor in 1901 when Victoria died, Sir James Reed, he will place a picture of John Brown in her coffin along with a lock of his hair. So there's another little piece of information. Uh, now, another historian, a guy called A. Ed Wilson, he believes that they shared a bed. This is what I'm literally reading what he wrote. He claims, A. Ed Wilson claims that they shared a bed, they hugged each other, but that they never actually consummated their relationship. And as evidence of that, he cites a courtier who overheard one of the Queen's daughters describing John Brown as Mama's lover. So according to Wilson, the, the Queen's children considered Brown and the Queen, their mother, as having some kind of a physical relationship. Uh, in addition, another piece of evidence which suggests that even if they weren't married, that there was something more to this relationship. Um, the, the Foreign Secretary, mm -hmm. roughly equivalent to the Secretary of State, the Foreign Secretary, the Earl of Derby, he recorded that the Queen and John Brown slept in adjoining rooms, which was contrary to all etiquette. And going back to my A. Ed Wilson, um, who's a very famous British historian, he claims that Victoria and Brown went through a marriage ceremony at Crathy Kirk in Balmoral. And if you look at the slide at the top, uh, towards the right, you can see a picture of the Kirk and the officiating minister confessed to it uh, on his deathbed. And so uh, that's where A.N. Wilson gets his information. And Rita, you have a really cute little story about the painting, don't you? This is a specially commissioned painting in the bottom right of John Brown and Victoria. Victoria commissioned it, and I almost bumped into it this past summer when we were in Scotland, because it is kept by Prince Charles in his favorite, um, how shall I describe it, country house that's part of his foundation that he sponsors. And we were on a tour of 12 or 15 people and many, many um, security guards walking around to make sure we didn't touch anything there. And I was so careful not to touch anything. I almost backed into this painting. But this painting is very, very similar to this one here of a photograph of the two of them. So it's very interesting to me that Prince Charles keeps it very close to him, but not in his personal residence in uh, the country estate that he is um, chairman of the foundation for. Right, and just one final thing I just want to say, uh, I read this a while ago. Um, some of you may remember a former British prime minister, a guy called Tony Blair uh, and his wife, uh, Sherry Booth. Um, and the queen still does this. Once a year, the queen will invite the prime minister and the prime minister's wife for a weekend together in Balmoral. There's no advisors, there's no other people around. Uh, it's just the Queen, the Prime Minister, and it's a chance for the two of them to, you know, build their relationship, work together, uh, know each other. And so the Queen does this every year. And Tony Blair and Cherry Booth were sort of having uh, sort of pre-dinner drinks with the Queen. And Sherry uh, Booth, Tony Blair's wife, asked the Queen the question I, I just asked, you know, did Victoria marry John Brown? And she asked the question to the queen. And Sherry Booth writes in her biography that the room temperature dropped like 10 degrees. Like the queen gave her a look like she'd never seen before. And um, Sherry Booth said that ever since that conversation, the queen never really spoke to her again, which kind of surprised me when I first read it, but perhaps it shouldn't really. I mean, after all, Victoria is still the queen's 
relative, you know, it's her great, great grandmother. And the queen is very protective of her great, great grandmother. And so any questions like that, uh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, if uh, you ever get invited to Buckingham Palace and you find yourself making small talk with the queen, don't ask about John Brown. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what we're looking at here is John Brown is uh, going to die in 1883. Uh, she has, uh, the thing we're looking at on the left is a granite fountain, uh, which she, she has a tea house at Frogmore, and this is uh, a memorial to him. Uh, what we're looking at on the right is a Balmoral. Uh, it's his grave marker. And it says, I know you can't read it because uh, it's kind of small, but it says, friend more than servant, loyal, truthful, brave, selfless duty, even to the grave. Uh, he's going to die, uh, essentially, uh, with uh, of cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, he was only in his 50s, but you know, he was consuming huge amounts of alcohol. And so it probably isn't surprising that, uh, you know, he died when he did. But um, okay. Let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about Victoria and the family. So we mentioned in part one that Victoria does not have a very good uh, parenting skills, so that shouldn't surprise anybody that she <laughs> doesn't have very good grandparenting skills either. This particular photograph was, uh, was never for public consumption. It was meant uh, for, you know, to send out to the relatives in Europe. But I mean, there is a PR piece to it. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, obviously Queen Victoria, and I believe these are the children of Edward the uh, Seventh. George the Fifth, I believe, is on the far left, and I think that's Princess Mary at the front. Well, anyway, um, Victoria, uh, one little story that I just want to share with you. So. Um, from time to time, the grandchildren are sort of dropped off with the grandmother at Windsor for a weekend. And uh, in 1868, Bertie, the Prince of Wales, her eldest son, drops off the kids uh, with the grandmother. And he warns her, this is what he says to her, he warns her to not be too strict with the grandchildren. This is what he literally said, to not be too strict with the grandchildren lest they should grow to dislike her, lest they should grow to dislike you. And we should very much wish them to be very fond of you as they were in Denmark of their other grandparents. <laughs> so their other grandparents are oh, Danish. Wow. Obviously, Victoria is the English uh, side of the family. And so uh, he's letting her know, you know, uh, treat my kids well. Uh, she remains indifferent to the children. Um, Another little story uh, relating to uh, John Brown, which I found out when I did some research into some of her children. Uh, Victoria turned a blind eye. Although John Brown treated her very well, although he could be a little forceful with some of his language, he was uh, not at all about bullying uh, Victoria's other children. Uh, and there's a story about um, one of her sons, Victoria's son, Lord Leopold, who uh, yells at John Brown because he refuses to bring him a, a chamber pot. And um, John Brown just shrugs and walks off. I mean, he just simply does what he wants. Um, essentially, uh, all the children, uh, all of Victoria's children, with, with the possible exception of Beatrice, the younger one, dislike John Brown uh, and his brother Archie. Uh, and then the other thing I want to mention very briefly is we talked about this. Um, here, Bertie, the son, uh, who recovered from typhoid. I got the date wrong, it's 1871, not 1881. He uh, nearly died from typhoid and he nearly died on that December the 14th day that we referenced earlier. Well, the queen, uh, even though she doesn't like to go out in public and even though she's essentially recluse at this point, uh, the queen is encouraged to attend a service of Thanksgiving at St. Paul's. And if you know London, St. Paul's is over in the east of the city and uh, Buckingham Palace is in the west. So you have to travel right to the city to get from the palace to St. Paul's. And Victoria thinks, okay, I'll go to the service at Thanksgiving. I don't want to go, even though it's my son, and even though it's a religious service, I don't want to go, but I will go. And so uh, she agrees to go. 
but she thinks she's going to dash across the city. Well, that prime minister that we talked about, Gladstone, he knows what she's up to. And so he deliberately puts the Speaker of the House of Commons, who by tradition has to ride in a, a, a very slow carriage. He puts his carriage in front of the Queen's carriage. So, so the Queen has to very slowly travel through London. Of course, she's furious because this is the last thing that she wants to do. Uh, but it kind of gives you a little bit of insight into you know, how she feels about her children, that she's not even sort of willing to go to a service of Thanksgiving. And if she does, she insists on dashing across. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the open nature of the relationship and the way in which it's oh, sorry, openly discussed. I don't, we don't know if it's exactly what the nature of the relationship is between the Queen uh, and John Brown. Um, at this particular time, um, Republican uh, complaints in Britain are getting louder. Republican, not in a party political sense, but Republican in the sense of uh, wanting Britain to be a republic like France. Um, center on the fact that the British taxpayer is paying uh, 34 million, the equivalent of $34 million a year uh, in taxes so that the Queen can live uh, a pretty lavish uh, lifestyle. And just to uh, bring you back up to that story about Gladstone, which I mentioned just very briefly. Uh, so Gladstone wants to go to Balmoral, he wants to get an interview, he wants to talk to the Queen. Um, he travels up there from London, um, he goes to Balmoral, the Queen claims that she's ill, refuses to see him for four days, then eventually she will grant the meeting, and uh, after 30 minutes, uh, you know, she uh, basically won't have any, uh, she won't allow him to say anything. Uh, she simply just uh, criticizes him and uh, move on. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the only other thing I want to mention is a couple of occasions when Victoria does perform her royal duties. Um, and uh, usually when Victoria does perform her royal duties, it's because she wants something uh, from Parliament. Uh, and so in 1875, she agrees to do the state opening. She is not above sending her kids to do the state opening, if you know anything about Britain. Uh, Parliament opens every year. The Queen is expected to attend. Uh, there's a speech that's read from the throne. Uh, but Victoria is more than happy to send her children. But in 1875, she agrees to go. And why does she agree to go? Because uh, she wants Parliament to make her the Empress of India. So at the moment, she's a queen. But if she gets the title Empress, she will have a higher rank. And of course, she fears uh, she wants the higher rank because her daughter, uh, Vicky, in Germany, will soon be an Empress. And so uh, she doesn't want her daughter to outrank her. Uh, the only other reason she goes to uh, Parliament is when her children marry, she likes to ask Parliament to grant annuities. Uh, and so we get examples of in 1866, she will go to Parliament because two children are going to get married and she wants Parliament to pony up the money uh, so that her two children can live at taxpayer expense. Next slide. Okay, let's get to Karim. So uh, this is, uh, hopefully I'll cover that question. I know somebody asked a question about Abdul Karim. So if I don't cover it, please come back in with that question again. So this is the other, uh, <clears throat> so after Albert's gone, John Brown's gone, uh, now we get Abdul Karim, okay? Uh, he is born in Agra, which if you know, is in Northern India, where the Taj Mahal is, and he's Muslim. <coughs> and essentially he is brought to England uh, in 1887 for the Golden Jubilee, Victoria has been on the throne at that point for 50 years. And he is brought to England, uh, he's a 24 year old, um, to work at table, to be a table servant. Effectively, somebody has a bright idea. Oh, now you're the Empress of India. Why don't we bring you into contact with more of your subjects? Uh, and Victoria is fascinated by all things India. And so this guy shows up and um, she takes a uh, shine to him. Um, she really likes him. And uh, within a couple of months, in fact, he evolves from being a table servant to cooking curries for Victoria. And uh, these are served every day, wherever Victoria is, even if she doesn't eat curry. Uh, and I believe that she does like curry, she will eat it. Uh, but these are served every day, uh, regardless of whether anyone actually eats them. Uh, the children hate them, if you know anything about curries, particularly 
uh, you know, they can be very strong uh, and the smell of a curry could linger for hours and days afterwards. Uh, so anyway, his role evolves. And then, um, so from table servant to cook, and then he evolves into uh, this next role, which is called a munchie or a teacher. Uh, I, he, oh, well, in, in terms of you know, learning about India, uh, she thinks it would be a good idea if uh, she could learn um, the language of uh, Northern India, which is uh, Erdu. And so um, essentially what happens is, is that uh, all the initial photographs of him waiting at table are destroyed and uh, Kareem sort of evolves into this new role as a teacher, as an instructor of the Urdu language uh, for Victoria. And Victoria uh, will absolutely not tolerate any criticism of Kareem or anybody mocking him or anybody, you know, claiming that he's got above his station. Um, but clearly, um, people at court see a parallel between Kareem and John Brown. John Brown is dead. Kareem's now in the picture. And so they see, you know, this, this pattern in Victoria's behavior. Uh, Victoria worries continually about Kareem getting racially abused by some of the servants. Uh, she does know her servants well enough, uh, particularly the servants in Scotland, to know that they would not like uh, to have to work with an Indian. And so she sends instructions to Balmoral that you know, certain servants need to be kept away from Kareem because she does not want him to suffer any racial abuse uh, at their hands. Uh, she also, interestingly, you can see it in this picture, she insists that Kareem always wear native clothing. And we always get these pictures of him. He wants to wear European dress, shirt and tie, collars, uh, but she absolutely insists that he always wear Indian clothes. And um, at this point, from teacher, we get his final role, which is essentially uh, sort of a private secretary. Uh, he will uh, help Victoria manage those tasks of being a queen. You know, keeping on top of government papers, you know, reading the important documents first, making sure that you know, the documents were returned correctly, and performing this role of a private servant. And he will commute daily with her. Uh, as you remember, Victoria likes Windsor. She doesn't like Buckingham Palace mm -hmm. for all kinds of reasons. She'll commute into Buckingham Palace when Parliament is in session uh, so that she can meet government ministers and Kareem will commute into. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what happens uh, in terms of her language instruction. So uh, for 14 years, Victoria will receive instruction in Urdu, um, which is the language of the Mughals. Uh, she will fill 13 notebooks. And when I talk about notebooks, I'm not talking about thin little composition um, uh, things. Uh, I'm talking about some things that look so big. If you remember sort of back before we had phones and you had those big uh, photograph albums where you could you know, put all your uh, pictures in, I'm talking about something that size. Uh, she will always refer to the language as Hindustani, uh, but it's really Urdu. And she insists every single day, every single day, she will have an hour of Urdu instruction, okay? Um, even when she travels uh, in February, March, she likes to go to Italy and France for a month. Uh, uh, Kareem thinks that he will get time off, but Victoria, you know, absolutely insists that wherever she is, uh, Kareem will always travel with her and so that he can give her that hour of instruction. Um, and so what happens is, is that uh, when, in terms of how he taught uh, Urdu to Victoria, uh, first of all, he would write a line in Urdu, uh, he would translate it into English, and then finally, he would write the line in Urdu again, but this time using Roman letters so she could see the sounds. So we've got it in Urdu, we've got a translation, and then we've got something that she can sort of, because it's in using Roman letters, it's gonna make the same sounds as it would sound in Urdu, so she can actually say it. 
Um, and then, of course, we mentioned about Kareem and her role, his role in terms of, you know, keeping her on top of um, government boxes and so on and so on. So uh, Victoria, Kareem would actually, in addition to the hour of uh, earlier instruction, um, he would also work with her on her government boxes, usually from about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And this next particular slide, I'm just going to let it sit for a second. I realize this might be difficult to see, but at the top, we've got the Urdu. Uh, in the middle, we should have a translation into English. Uh, and then at the bottom, I hope if I've done this correctly, uh, we should be able to see it written so that she could actually say it. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, so, um, as you can probably well imagine, uh, Kareem's special treatment uh, causes all kinds of uh, jealousy. Uh, what we're looking at here, first of all, is, and I'm sure I'm not saying this correctly, but this is uh, a little cottage. Uh, it's called Glassel Shiel. Uh, it's, it was called the Widow's Cottage. It's three hours from Balmoral. Uh, she had it built uh, after Albert's death. And it takes about three hours, as I say, to get from Balmoral to this. Uh, you know, you would think that Balmoral would be a place where you could be on your own, but apparently for Victoria, you know, that wasn't enough. So she needed another place where she could really be on her own. And I guess three hours from Balmoral would qualify as that. Uh, so she has it built after Albert's death. Uh, when it was first built, she actually celebrated its completion with John Brown. So she invited John Brown. He then dies. Uh, and essentially, the place stays empty uh, until uh, 1889, when uh, she invites uh, Kareem there. And of course, all the courtiers are furious because they would all love to have been invited uh, to this uh, little widow's cottage because nobody was ever invited there. But there's Kareem uh, going to uh, this special little place. Uh, and the only other thing I want to mention is um, just an example of some of the snobbery that Kareem had to face. So um, Ellen Terry, a very famous actress in the late 19th century, she, was, she did a performance at Sandringham which is a home belonging to her eldest son, Bertie. Uh, she did a special performance just for the royal court. And Kareem was furious that he had to sit with the servants. So the servants were allowed to watch. Obviously, all the members of the household could watch. And he was furious that he was seated with the servants rather than the royal household. And Victoria was furious too. And she found out that they seated him with the servants. Uh, she really uh, laid into the person who made that decision. So, of course, the question at this point is, you know, had Abdul replaced Brown? And yeah, in short, the answer is yes. Um, next slide, please. So, of course, all things must come to an end. And I sort of mentioned briefly uh, that the kids didn't like the curries. They also didn't like Kareem either. Uh, and it was pretty obvious to anybody that once the Queen died, um, Kareem's time at the court would be uh, finished. Uh, Victoria will write her uh, funeral uh, her funeral directions in 1897, and she makes Bertie promise that Kareem be allowed to attend the funeral. And Bertie does Edward the Seventh or Bertie uh, does allow uh, Abdul Kareem to attend. But once the funeral is over. Um, well, the first thing he does is he uh, goes into Kareem's house. Kareem lives in a little property on Windsor. Uh, he has all, uh, he has basically his uh, palace security guys, these ex-military guys go in, seize anything that, uh, any letters, any photographs, anything that could directly link Victoria to Kareem is taken outside, it is burned. Um, Kareem is ordered to leave, so he does, he is able to attend the funeral, but he's ordered to leave. Um, and to be fair to Victoria, I mean, she does set him up nicely. Uh, he returns to Agra, you know, she gives him money, she gives him land. Uh, he returns to India, a very wealthy man. Uh, fortunately, though, um, even though a lot of his, um, 
objects, a lot of the letters between himself and uh, the queen are destroyed, he d is able to get his diary out. And uh, that diary, for reasons I don't fully understand, remains hidden. Uh, it's discovered in 2010. Uh, the family will, his family, his descendants will migrate to Pakistan during, after the partition, but the diary uh, remains um, secret until 2010. And that's how we know, um, you know, about the relationship. Well, we, we knew about it before, but we have this level of detail about the relationship that we didn't have. Okay, so we're going to uh, pause for a second, and we just want to show you a very quick little video of Victoria, because we haven't actually seen her in the flesh. It's going to be a very short uh, video, but um, what you're seeing here is a Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, and I'm going to talk over it because there isn't any audio with the video. Um, and this is going to take place in 1897. Uh, it's a glorious day. Uh, it's June 1897, and when we get to it, we'll pause it so you can see it better. But Victoria is agreed uh, to be transported from Buckingham Palace to St. Paul's for a service of Thanksgiving. Unlike that other service where she dashed across London, she was happy to have a normal public procession where the carriages move at a slow pace so everybody uh, can see her. Uh, I think one thing that's kind of interesting about this particular, um, uh, you don't get to see this, about this particular um, event is that at this point, Victoria is health. I mean, she's effectively, uh, she's effectively lame. I mean, she's unable to move uh, without the aid of a wheelchair. And so what happens is, is that when she gets to St. Paul's, um, instead of getting out of the carriage, and climbing all the steps and then going into the cathedral. Uh, the cathedral has to come out to Victoria. And so she remains in her carriage for 20 minutes. Uh, the bishops and archbishop come out, they conduct the service uh, in the street. And, uh, you know, Victoria is not a particularly religious woman. So she uh, really likes services to be short. Takes about 20 minutes and Victoria waves, smiles and off she goes. So I think uh, in a second, uh, we'll see Victoria. We won't get a great shot of her, but at least we will see her. Uh, a million people uh, were actually on the streets of London uh, this day. And from what we understand is that Victoria was moved to tears. Uh, she really didn't think that uh, she would get this kind of response from the population of London. She thought people would be largely indifferent to her. Uh, but a million people come out, uh, 300,000 of Britain's poor was treated to a special Jubilee dinner. Uh, so they were providing food. In India, 19,000 prisoners were pardoned because of this one day, 19,000 uh, prisoners were pardoned. Uh, Here she is down, brother. Yep, there she is, okay. And uh, the only other silly little thing I, I just want to mention is that uh, although the day was a huge success, mm. uh, the organization of the day was a logistical nightmare because her daughter came over, Vicky, uh, who was an empress. And so she had to have her own carriage because uh, Victoria, because of her weight, uh, because of her uh, physical limitations, she had to have one side of the carriage. But according to royal etiquette, uh, empresses can't sit with their backs to the horses. So Vicky had to have her own carriage so that when she drove through, she wouldn't have her back uh, to the horses. Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Okay, Marianne uh, said, the TV show said Munchie was married. Is that true? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear the question. Is Munchie married and yes. Yes, 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 he was married. And he brought his wife over. Yes. This is kind of like the saddest part of my presentation now. Oh, yes, yeah, just before we get to that, I just want to give a little shout out for the beautiful plate that you can see on the right. Uh, Dawn uh, Fletcher from the Ollie office uh, provided it. Uh, it's a wonderful artifact. I did, she shared it with me last week, and I'm so pleased that she did. Uh, these plates were uh, handed out uh, all over Britain, and um, 
I am just delighted to be able to include that plate. So thank you, Dawn, for sharing that. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, the saddest part of the way, because as I mentioned, I really liked Victoria in part one. But there's things in part two that I don't like about her, but um, the last years are sadly the saddest in some ways. Um, so in 1897, she is the longest reigning monarch. Uh, she's just uh, overtaken her grandfather, George III. Um, she's reigned for over 60 years at this point. Uh, you can't really see it too clearly in the picture, but uh, she's effectively blind at this point. Uh, she has cataracts um, and she won't have surgery. Cataract surgery uh, was available. Um, I don't know if I would want to have the kind of uh, procedures that they used on my eyes, but she did not want the cataracts to be removed. She would complain that, you know, if only she could find the right pair of glasses that she would see again, or she would complain about candles and say that they weren't bright enough. Uh, there's one cute little story uh, where she goes off to, there's a Rothschild mansion in the west of London called Waterston, and the Rothschild mansion was one of the first places in England to be electrified, and she loved it because, uh, you know, she was, I don't know if she was literally running around because her, you know, she wasn't very mobile, but uh, she could see the lights. It was so bright. She was turning them off and on. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, you know, she loved technology. So I do kind of like that image of her being excited, running around, turning lights off and on. But anyway, she's blind at this point. Um, she can't move without a wheelchair. Um, and essentially, she's sort of reorganized her household at this point uh, so that she's seen as little as possible. Um, so, for example, um, you know, prior to this, you know, if you wanted her to, you wanted to communicate something to her, then you could speak to her directly, or you could go through somebody else who would speak to her directly. Uh, from the mid to late 1890s onwards, all communication with Victoria is required to be in writing. Uh, if you were uh, reprimanded for something, that was delivered in writing too. Uh, and uh, you were to leave your requests in special boxes marked for the Queen. Um, if you had a request, uh, you had to pen a letter, and then you said your name, and then you would write, presents humble duty to your majesty, and then whatever the request was, then you had to place it in an envelope, it was addressed to the Queen, and you had to seal the envelope but not lick it, which I thought was interesting. Um, <laughs> nobody was allowed to go outside, until the queen had been outside. She didn't want members of her, uh, some of the members of the court, she didn't want the servants to see her outside when she was um, in her wheelchair. And if you were outside and the queen was outside, uh, you were expected to hide behind a bush. Uh, you were expected to make yourself uh, invisible. Uh, and then other sort of bizarre things, which I don't really understand why she did this, but from some point in the 18, uh, 1890s, she started to introduce these bizarre economies. Um, I mean, nothing had happened to her you know, royal annuity. It was still $34 million a year. But she decided that she wasn't going to provide toilet paper uh, in her royal palaces. Instead, people were expected to cut up newspaper, cut it into squares, and use that. Uh, I don't know why. Um, and she continues something that we mentioned before about the room temperature things. You know, you couldn't have fires on even in the winter. You know, if she found out that a room had been heated to more than 60 degrees, she was furious. You know, you got a dressing down from the queen, well, probably in writing, not in person. Um, and I think, you know, bizarrely as well, because I mean, at this point, given that she's blind, given that she's lame, you know, one would think that she would want to start to involve her son and, you know, allow him to see her work as a monarch and read government papers and allow him to have some input. But she absolutely refuses to allow uh, Bertie to have any, any involvement, any training, uh, so that, you know, the first time he gets to see an official government paper is, you know, after her death. Next slide, please. So moving on. Um, so we need to talk about the end, of course. So we're looking here 
at uh, the photograph on the right, obviously, is a um, photograph of where she died. This is going to be in Osborne on the Isle of Wight. Um, you can still visit it today. I haven't been, uh, but uh, if I ever do go, I'm sure I will pay uh, uh, Osborne a visit. Uh, and you can see they've kept the room, you know, pretty accurate, pretty faithful to how it looked in uh, 1901 uh, when Victoria died. Uh, it is though no longer owned by the royal family. Uh, when Victoria died, her son didn't want it. He didn't have particularly happy memories of the place. And so, um, yeah, okay, next slide, please. So let's talk about it, the death. So she is gonna die. She's gonna die on January the 18th, uh, 1901 in Osborne. As we mentioned, she's got cataracts, she's got rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the last 12 months haven't been good times for her. Her son, uh, Alfred, will die uh, in 1900 um, and her Vicky uh, daughter, if you remember the, the wonderkind who could speak French in 18 months, uh, she is dying from cancer in Germany. Uh, and so of course this must have been on Victoria's mind. Victoria's gonna die of a stroke and at the end mm -hmm. she's unable to eat, uh, she's exhausted, she has a lack of sleep. Um, and um, however, that being said, uh, we mentioned, obviously, Kareem's going to be allowed to attend, and uh, in terms of those uh, instructions, she is going to put together her plan uh, for uh, her instructions for her death and funeral arrangements uh, as early as 1897. Uh, it's a little bit saddened at the end that um, the Queen clearly knew she was dying, Victoria clearly knew she was dying, but um, she seemed to fail that if she rallied a little bit, she could live a little longer. Uh, she wanted, she said that she had other things that she still needed to do. It's not clear what those other things were, but um, she does ask uh, her doctor, Sir James, she asks the doctor, she says, am I better? Um, I should like to live a little longer as I still have a few things to settle. Uh, her doctor lies to her, essentially, uh, and tells her that, yes, your majesty has been very ill, but now you're better. Okay. So this is, remember we saw the picture of Albert and the, uh, his deathbed photo. Uh, this is a more carefully staged photo. This is Victoria on her deathbed. Um, this is um, going to uh, be, uh, you can see she's got all these flowers around her. You can see the picture of Albert above the bed. Uh, if we go to the next picture, I think there's a, there's a charcoal drawing, yeah. This is a little easier to see what she looked like, someone's sort of charcoal drawing, and all those flowers and all the other things around her. Uh, we go back to the, as you can see, were actually quite useful because as we'll, we'll you know, reiterate, uh, there were lots of things included in the funeral uh, that she wanted, that she didn't want the kids to know. So that sort of made it very easy if you wanted to hide John Brown's ring or a locket of his hair, uh, you know, with all that stuff around her. Uh, it was very easy to do so. So let's very quickly just look at, uh, we've seen the charcoal drawing. We're going to go to the funeral, the funeral and then I'll talk about the funeral itself. But I just want you to see the funeral. Um, remember, Albert's funeral wasn't a big deal, uh, but she wanted a massive state funeral. And you can clearly see that she got it. So we're going to pause it in a second. Here's the funeral carriage coming around. Okay, there you can see it. There's the, uh, the imperial crown, there's a the coffin, there's a gun carriage. If we just go a little bit more, I think we'll see the eldest son, the new king, Edward VII, I think coming around right behind. A little more. Yes, we see the guys with the plumes on their head. Yes, a little more. Okay, yes, there we go. So we pause there, we can see Edward the Seventh on the on the right, and I believe the guy to next to him is the Kaiser, uh, Emperor of Germany. Um, there's a touching story that uh, Queen Victoria essentially died in his arms. Uh, he held her up at the end for the last two and a half hours, and um, at this point he's extremely popular in Britain because he dashed over from Germany uh, to be with his grandmother, his English grandmother, 
of course, 13 years later with the start of the First World War, uh, not so popular. So anyway, let's just look at that funeral then in a little bit more detail. I just want you to see what it looked like. Uh, so, I, do we have a question? No? Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned, Victoria is, uh, she'd already wrote down her funeral uh, instructions as early as 1897. Uh, she left instruction that the, um, she wanted to be buried, uh, she wanted to wear her white dress and her wedding veil. Um, so uh, in addition to that, uh, one of Albert's dressing gowns was placed beside her. Uh, in the coffin with a plastic cast of his hand. Uh, in her left hand, hidden behind all those flowers, was a lock of John Brown's hair, which was carefully concealed uh, by the flowers. Um, she also wore the wedding ring of John Brown's mother, uh, something that he gave to her in 1883 when he died. And I mentioned that Dr. Reed had placed um, the ring uh, on, her on her hand. Uh, the queen refused to be embalmed. Uh, and as you'll see in a second, that, that becomes significant. She refused to be a bum. And so what they did was they put her on charcoal um, uh, so that it would absorb the moisture and the smell. Uh, but luckily it was January in England, so you know, it wasn't as if she died in the summer. Uh, they cut off her hair. And of course, ultimately that body is gonna to go to the mausoleum that we saw. Um, nevertheless, even though Victoria did her bit in terms of you know, all the planning that took place, Okay, so um, even though she did all the planning and she let them know what she wanted, the royal household didn't actually bother to read um, what it is that she wanted. And essentially, they just, you know, panic broke out, literally. I mean, people did not know what to do. She wanted this massive state funeral, and they thought that she was going to go, they were going to provide her with this little private candle in affair that Albert had had. But, you know, she, you know, her vision was very different. So, um, essentially, she wanted this, were, she wanted the no embalming, there was going to be no lying in of state. She didn't want mourning, she didn't want any black mourning. She wanted a white funeral, purple and white. Uh, she wanted white ponies, there was going to be a gun carriage, and she was going to be the first a monarch to be buried outside Westminster Abbey in St. George's Chapel, because we mentioned she's going to be buried at uh, the Frogmore Mausoleum in Windsor. Um, nevertheless, um, oh, and I should mention one other thing. Um, she also left in her directions that she didn't uh, wanted, uh, she didn't want a death mask. She didn't want a death mask to be cast, uh, but the Kaiser showed up and he wanted one. He wanted to take a death mask back to Germany with him. And so uh, the royal family were furious because, you know, the mother left instructions for no death mask. The Kaiser wants a death mask. So here you have members, senior members of the royal family guarding the body in case the Kaiser comes in and tries to get his death mask. Uh, in addition to that, um, they got word to the royal undertaker in London. She's at Osborne. He shows up at Osborne, forgets to bring the coffin. So they had to build a coffin on site, have it delivered. Uh, while all that's taking place, the Kaiser causes more problems because um, the Bishop of Winchester's at Osborne, uh, basically to provide you know, comfort and counselling to the bereaved family members. And the Bishop of Winchester is a pretty uh, liberal uh, theologian, which is one of the reasons why Victoria liked him. But well, whatever he said to uh, the Kaiser uh, led to the Kaiser telling him that if he was in Germany, meaning the Bishop of Windsor, if the Bishop of Windsor was in Germany, then he would have had him taken out into the courtyard by the neck and shot. So you can imagine while this sort of, you know, the family gathered, uh, Kaiser causing problems. So, um, so we mentioned the funeral, uh, Kareem's going to be there. People are selling this massive state of fur, uh, sort of uh, entrepreneurial types are selling seats uh, with a view of the procession. You can get yourself a good seat to the equivalent of about 25 guineas, which is about 3,000 uh, pounds. The Pope refuses to send anyone to the funeral because it's a Protestant queen. Uh, and he also uh, would not have an official mass said for her. 
Uh, Victoria's body will cross over on February the 1st, 1901. And it'll be flanked by 11 miles of 11 miles. This is how big the British Navy was. 11 miles of battleships and cruisers will escort the body to the mainland of England. Uh, when it gets to London, it gets to St. George's Chapel. Um, the chaos continues. Um, there's a mix up about the times. And essentially, the guests are told to arrive an hour too early. And so when they realize there's been a mistake, uh, the guests are uh, then told to reseat. People won't move because they've got good seats because they're early and sit guests are getting dragged from the seats to the new seats. Uh, and so essentially, uh, the whole thing is a disaster. But nevertheless, um, the funeral goes ahead and the total cost is going to be close to about four and a half million pounds, which is, you know, quite a significant sum of money. Okay, let's get to the diaries. So I think we mentioned in part one, uh, about the diaries. I just put up some pictures of what they look like. Um, so Victoria seemed to uh, average about, can we go back to the diary slide please? Yeah, Victoria seemed to average about two and a half thousand words a day in her adult life. And so she kept uh, about 122 volumes. And I think I mentioned that the daughter, uh, Beatrice became literary executor and would sort of transcribed all these diaries edited and got them down to essentially a third of what they were uh, before. Um, yeah. Okay, a slide. We're trying to keep within the three o'clock time limit here. So, Victorian contact. So, as you can see here, you know, when you live 64 years, you pretty much outlast everybody. She essentially outlasted everybody at the Privy Council, which is the senior advisors around the Queen. Um, she basically outlasted everybody in the House of Commons at the time of her accession. She outlived all of her bride, bridesmaids. Uh, she outlived 10 prime ministers, five archbishops of Canterbury, 18 presidents, I was shocked by that, 11 viceroys of Canada. Um, uh, but, you know, as we mentioned at the start, you know, Victoria, she reigns, she doesn't rule. So it's difficult when we think about the legacy, uh, you know, she doesn't have any policy decisions to make. And so we can't really judge her because she doesn't really have any uh, influence or power in that area. But in terms of, you know, we think about major social and political changes taking place in Britain, uh, she's not in favor of democracy. But nevertheless, she makes monarchy work. She makes it respectable. She does her job. This is the training that she received from Albert. Uh, she makes the monarchy respectable. Um, she also remains rather aloof from things like she's opposed to suffrage. She's not interested in uh, you know, social and political like trade union movements or home rule for Ireland. Next slide, please. Um, and she's not interested in her workers who are striking for better working conditions, more pay, but she does the job. As I've mentioned, she examines those boxes. She reads papers. She speaks to ministers. And so she really gives to her son and all the people who come after her a strong sense of duty, transparency, and honesty. And here's my final quote, and I'm gonna stop. Uh, and I just like it. Uh, I, I know it really relates to her more in the first part than the second part, but um, when I think of Victoria, I do like to think of her as this sort of, you know, woman who is, you know, vivacious lady, plainly dressed, not much dignity or pretension. You know, a woman who knows who she is, she knows what she is, and she's gonna enjoy herself. And I'm gonna stop there, and thank you so much.